And you know, people are very, 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 very tough. And it turns out that if you face things, it turns out that if you face things that you can put up with a lot more than you think you can put up with, and you can do it without becoming corrupted. And she did recover quite, quite fully, and much as a consequence of her own machinations, because she figured out what was wrong with her and then took the necessary steps to fix it, which is nothing short of a bloody miracle, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, anyways, part of the, the, the cat bit is, I actually start by talking about our dog, who actually died about a year ago, but he's still alive in the book. Um, I, you know, I let people know, because dog lovers love dogs, and if you love cats, then they think you don't like dogs, and then they, you don't, they don't like you. So I also point out at the beginning of the chapter that, you know, if you want to pet a dog on the street, that's okay too, so you don't have to get up in arms about it. But, but the idea is that, you know, you have to be alert when you're suffering. You have to be alert to the beauty in life, the unexpected beauty in life. And that's kind of what I was trying to get across with the idea of the cat. There's this cat that lives across the street from us called Ginger, and Ginger's a Siamese cat. And cats really aren't domesticated, eh? Technically speaking, they're still wild animals, but they kind of like people. God only knows why, but they do, you know? And so Ginger will come wandering over, and our dog looks at her, but they're friends, and she rolls over on his back, and Seiko used to, you know, nose her a bit. And, and then she'd kind of mosey over and let you pet her if she was feeling like it that day. And, you know, you have to look for those little bit of, that little bit of sparkling crystal in the darkness when things are bad. You have to look and see where things are still beautiful and where there's still something that's sustaining. And, you know, you narrow your time frame and you be grateful for what you have. And that can get you through some very dark times and maybe even successfully if you're lucky but even if unsuccessfully then maybe it's only tragic and not absolute hell and you can do that you know in the worst situation you can make it only tragic and not hell and there's a big gap between tragedy and hell you know there's nothing worse at a deathbed than to see the people there fighting the death is bad enough but you can take that, as terrible as it is, and make it into something that's absolutely unbearable. And maybe I think, and this is sort of what I closed the book with, is this idea is that if we didn't all attempt to make terrible things even worse than they are, then maybe we could tolerate the terrible things that we have to put up with in order to exist. And maybe we could make the world into a better place, you know? And it's what we should be doing and what we could be doing because we don't have anything better to do. And that's what the book is about. And that's the end of 12 Rules for Life. Every time you learn something, you learn because something you did didn't work. And that exposes you to the part of the world that you don't understand. Every time you're exposed to a part of the world that you don't understand, you have the possibility of rebuilding the structures that you use to interpret the world. That's often why it's more important to notice that you're wrong than it is to prove that you're right. One of the things that you're supposed to learn in university is precisely that. It might be useful to listen to people that annoy you on the off chance that they know something that, if they tell you, you can use instead of dying. Talking to people who agree with what you say is like walking around in a desert. You already know everything that they say. The reason you're associating with them in that situation is so that they never say anything that challenges you because you're afraid that if you go outside of what you understand that you won't be able to tolerate the chaos. But it isn't the case. People have an unbelievable capacity to face and overcome things they don't understand. And not only that, that's essentially what gives life its meaning. The Buddhists say, life is suffering. And you think, well, if that's the case, why bother with it? And people do ask that question, and they ask it in ways that result in their own destruction, and worse, in the destruction of others. So for example, people who become particularly cruel, particularly in a genocidal manner, are more than willing to dispense with as many human beings as they, they can possibly train their sights on because they're so disgusted by the nature of human limitation that they'd rather eradicate it. And lots of people become suicidal because they can't bear the conditions of their own existence. And suffering is real and it's inescapable. So the question is, what do you do about it? People don't get what they want is because they don't actually figure out what it is. And the probability that you're going to get what would be good for you, let's say, which would even be better than what you want, right? Because, you know, you might be 
wrong about what you want easily. But maybe you could get what would really be good for you. Well, why don't you? Well, because you don't try. You don't think, okay, here's what I would like if I could have it. And, and I don't mean, I don't mean in a way that you manipulate the world to force it to deliver you goods for status or something like that. That isn't what I mean. I mean something like, imagine that you were taking care of yourself like you were someone you actually cared for. And then you thought, okay, I, I'm caring for this person. I would like things to go as well for them as possible. What would their life have to be like in order for that to be the case? Well, people don't do that. They don't sit down and think, all right, you know, let's, let's figure it out. You're, you've got a life. It's hard, obviously. It's like three years from now, you can have what you need. You've got to be careful about it. You can't have everything. You can have what would be good for you. But you have to figure out what it is. And then you have to aim at it. Well, my experience with people has been is if they figure out what it is that would be good for them and then they aim at it, then they get it. And it's strange because they don't necessarily, it's a strange thing. It's not quite that simple because, you know, you may formulate an idea about what would be good for you and then you take 10 steps towards that and you find out that your formulation was a bit off and so you have to reformulate your goal. You know, you're, so you're kind of going like this as you move towards the goal. But a huge part of the reason that people fail is because they don't ever set up the criteria for success. And so, since success is a very narrow line and very unlikely, the probability that you're going to stumble on it randomly is zero. And so, there's a proposition here, and the proposition is, if you actually want something, you can have it. Now, the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea, right? It's like, you don't get everything. Obviously. You, obviously. But maybe you can have what you need. And maybe all you have to do to get it is ask. But the asking isn't a whim or, or today's wish. It's like, you have to be deadly serious about it. You have to think, okay, like I'm taking stock of myself. And if I was going to live properly in the world, and I was going to set myself up such that being would justify itself in my estimation, and I don't mean as a harsh judge, exactly what is it that I would aim at? Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, uh, what's, what remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? And if you actually ask that question, but you have to want to know the answer, right? Because that's actually what asking the question means. It doesn't mean just mouthing the words. It means you have to decide that you want to know. You'll figure that's out so fast it'll make your hair curl. It's not an accident that the axiomatic Western individual is someone who was unfairly nailed to a cross and tortured. It's like, yes, right, exactly. So what do you do about that? Well, I thought about that for a long time too. It's like, well, you don't get together in a damn mob. Because all that does is allow you to be as horrible as you could possibly imagine and suffer from none of the consequences. That's a bad idea. So how about we don't do that? Well, there's a deep idea in the West too. It's like, pick up your damn suffering and bear it. And try to be a good person so you don't make it worse. Well, that's a truth. You know, I read a lot about the terrible things that people have done to each other. You just cannot even imagine it. It's so awful. So you don't want to be someone like that. Now, do you have a reason to be? Yes. You have a lots of reasons to be. God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is going to die. You know, you too. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way. And lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, yeah, no wonder you're resentful. It's like, act it out and see what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit, and that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. <laughs> so you think, well, what do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's 
what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Well, who wants to admit that? Well, just think about it. Well, so what do you do in the face of that suffering? Try to reduce it. Start with yourself. What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies, you're not whining away in a corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. Of course you're a victim. Jesus, obviously. Put yourself together. And then maybe if you put yourself together, you know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you, if you'll admit it. You know there's a few things you could like polish up a little bit that you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit and then your eyes will be a little more open and then you can shine yourself up a little bit more and then maybe you could bring your family together instead of having them be the hateful, spiteful, neurotic, infighting batch that you're like doomed to spend Christmas with. So then you fix yourself up a little bit, kind of humbly, because, you know, God, you're a fixer-upper if there ever was one. And then you got to figure out, well, can you figure out how to make peace with your idiot brother? And probably not, because he's just as dumb as you, so how the hell are you going to manage that? And so then you, maybe you get somewhere that way, and your family's sort of functioning, and you find out, well, that kind of relieved a little bit of suffering, although it reduced the opportunities for spiteful revenge, and that's kind of a pain in the neck. And so... Then you get your family together a little bit, and you're a little clued in then, at least a bit, because you've done something difficult that's actually difficult. You're a little wiser, and so then maybe you can put a tentative finger out beyond the family and try to change some little thing without wrecking it. It's like, our society is complex, and we teach our students that they could just fix it. It's like, go fix a military helicopter and see how far you get with that. It's like, what are you going to do? You're like a chimp with a wrench. Whack! Oh, look, it's better. It's like, no, it's not better. Things are complicated, and to fix things is really hard. And you have to be like a, a golden tool to fix things, and you're not. So, and that's the other message of the West. It's like, how do you overcome the suffering of, the, of life? And I'm not saying it's only the message of the West. How do you overcome the suffering of life? Is be a better person. That's how you do it. Well, that's hard. It takes responsibility. And I think, you know, if you said to someone, you want to have a meaningful life? Everything you do matters. That's the definition of a meaningful life. But everything you do matters. So you're gonna to have to carry that with you. Or do you want to just forget about the whole meaning thing and then you don't have any responsibility because who the hell cares? And you can wander through life doing whatever you want, gratifying impulsive desires for how useful that's going to be. And you're stuck in meaninglessness, but you don't have any responsibility. Which one do you want? Well, ask yourself, which one are you pursuing? And you'll find very rapidly that it isn't the majority of your soul that's pursuing the whole meaning thing. Because, well, look what you have to do to do that. Yeah have to take on the fact that life is suffering. You have to put yourself together in the face of that. Well, that's hard. Christ, it's amazing people can even do it. I'm stunned every day when I go outside and it isn't a, a riot with everything burning. Because really, God, you talk to people, it's like, I knew this guy, he'd been in a motorcycle accident and it really ruined him. And he was like a linesman, you know, working on the power. And he was working with someone who had Parkinson's disease. And, they had complementary inadequacies. And so two of them could do the job of one person. And so they're out there fixing power lines in the freezing cold, despite the fact that one was three quarters wrecked with a motorcycle accident, and the other one had Parkinson's. It's like, that's how our civilization works. It's like, there's all these ruined people out there. They've got problems like you can't believe. Off they go to work and do things they don't even like. And look, the lights are on. My God, it's <laughs> unbelievable. It's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And we're so ungrateful. College students, the postmodern types, they're so ungrateful. You know, they don't know that they're surrounded by just a bloody miracle. It's a miracle that all this stuff works, that all you crazy chimpanzees that don't know each other can sit in the same room for two hours sweltering away without tearing each other apart, because that's what chimps do. So, <sighs> anyways, so, 
what happened? Well, I made some videos and I got to the bottom of some things, at least as far as I could tell, so I told you what the bottom is, and then I got this idea about what you might do about it, which isn't my idea, it's like it's not my idea, it's an old, 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 old idea, it's far older than Christianity, it's old, it's the oldest story of mankind. Get yourself together, transcend your suffering, see if you can be some kind of hero, make the suffering in the world less. Well, that's the way forward, as far as I can tell, if there is any way forward. Final rule. It's called pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. And it's, it's, a very, it's the most personal chapter in the book. It's a lot about my daughter. And my daughter was very ill when she was, well, when she was a kid, but well, particularly when she was a teenager. She had a very terrible time of it. Um, she had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and when she was between the ages of 14 and 16, it first destroyed her hip, which had to be replaced, and then it destroyed the ankle on her other leg, which had to be replaced. And she walked around for two years on broken legs, and she was taking massive doses of opiates and could hardly stay awake. And, like, and she had this advanced autoimmune disease, which produced all sorts of other symptoms that were just as bad as the joint degeneration, but which are harder to describe. And so it's just bloody brutal. You know, and as a test of your faith, there's almost nothing that's more direct than a serious illness inflicted upon an innocent child, right? And so the chapter is a meditation on that and also on, well, what to do in a situation like that because everyone is going to have a situation like that in some sense, you know, because you'll be faced with illness in the people that you love and in crisis. And so it's a, dis it's a practical guide to coping with those sorts of things. Like, and one of the things you do when you're overwhelmed by crisis is you shorten your time frame. You know, it's like you can't think about next month. Maybe you can't even bloody well think about next week or maybe not even tomorrow. You know, because now is just so overwhelming that that's all there is. It's like, and that's what you do. You cut your time frame back until you can cope with it. And if it's not the next week that you see how to get through, then it's the next day. And if it's not the next day, then it's the next hour. And if it's not the next hour, then it's the next minute. The internal problem is, how do you deal with tragedy and malevolence? And you can say, well, I'm not prepared. It's like, yeah, fair enough unsurprising especially if you were overprotected as a child it's not a good idea to overprotect your kids because the snakes are going to come into the garden no matter what you do and so then you instead of trying to keep the damn snakes away what you do is you arm your child with something that can help them chop them into pieces and make the world out of them so that the, the trick for human thriving in the face of suffering and malevolence is strength not protection it's a completely different idea. We also know this clinically. We know, for example, that if you treat people with exposure therapy for agoraphobia, which is roughly speaking the fear of chaos, I would say, the fear of everything, you don't make them less afraid. You make them braver. It's not the same thing. Because with an agoraphobic, see, what happens to them is, is the fall. They never conceptualize death and suffering. They're naive, right? It, it never enters their, the theater of their imagination, and it's because they're protected from it. But then something happens. This, this often happens to women in their 40s because they're, they're the people most likely to develop agoraphobia. Something happens. They're, they've been protected from chaos by authority their entire life. So maybe they had an overprotective father and then they went to an overprotective boyfriend and then they went to an overprotective husband. And maybe they were willing to be subjugated to all three of those because of the prote protection, right? So, so that's the bargain. They, they stay weak and dependent and maybe they have to because that's the only way they can appeal to the person who's hyperprotective. But the price they pay for that is that they're not sufficiently competent. And then something happens in their life, often in their 40s, they develop heart palpitations maybe as a consequence of menopause. Their heart starts to beat erratically and they think, oh no, death. It's like, well, who are you going to talk to about that? Right? There's no protection from authority for that or maybe their friend gets divorced, or maybe their sister dies, or something like that. It brings up the specter of mortality, and maybe the specter of malevolence and mortality, and it brings it up in a way that authority, recourse to authority, cannot solve. And so then they have panic attacks. What happens? They go out, they get afraid, they feel their heart beating, then they get afraid of their heart beating because they think, oh no, I'm going to die, and they think, oh no, I'm going to die, and I'm going to make a fool of myself while I'm doing it and attract a lot of attention. So the two big fears come up. Mortality and social judgment. 
and then they have a panic attack. It's like fight or flight's gone out of control. Very, very unpleasant. Then they start to avoid the places they've had a panic attack. Then they end up not being able to go anywhere. So then Tiamat has come back, right? A huge monster, a little victim. And so what do you do with them? Well, you, there's no saying, no, there's no Tiamat. That's done, right? Their naivety is over. They, they've had a direct contact with the threat of mortality and social judgment. They've met the terrible mother and they've met the terrible father. And there's no going back. There's no saying, oh, the world is safe. It's not safe. Not at all. It's not safe. The fact that you think it's safe means that you were living in an unconscious bubble that was sort of provided to you by your culture. It's a gift. And now that's been shattered. And so now what do you do? Well, the answer is you retreat until you're in your house and there's nowhere you can go. You're the ultimate frozen rabbit, right? And your life is hell because you can't function. The alternative is, let's take apart the things you're afraid of. Let's expose you to them, you know, carefully and programmatically. And then you'll learn that you can, you're actually tougher than you think. You never knew that. And maybe you didn't want to take on the responsibility because, you know, people play a role in their own demise, so to speak. When you had opportunity to go out and explore or withdraw because you were afraid, you chose to withdraw because you were afraid. So it's not only that you were overprotected often, it's that you were willing to take advantage of the fact that you were overprotected and run back there whenever you had the opportunity. You know, so maybe you're a kid in the playground, right, and you're having some trouble with other kids, and you know in the back of your mind, I should deal, this with, deal with this myself, but you go and tell your mom and get her to intervene. And you know that that's not right. You know that you're breaking the social contract, but it's easier, and so that's what you do. You run off to an authority figure and hide behind the great father, right, roughly speaking. Well, the problem with that is you don't learn how to do it yourself. So then you have to relearn it painfully when you're 40. So then you take people out, you say, well, what are you afraid of? Rank it from one to 10. So 10 is, we'll make a list of 10 things you're afraid of. The least, the thing you're least afraid of, we'll call number 10. So we'll start with that. Okay, well, I'm afraid of elevators. Okay, well, let's, let's look at a picture of an elevator. Let's have you imagine being in an elevator. Let's go out to an elevator and let you watch the terrible jaws of death open because that's how you're responding to it symbolically, right? And you're gonna do that at it at the, the closest proximity you can manage. You find out you go do that, it works. You're nervous as hell, especially an, from an anticipatory perspective, shaking. You go out, you stop, you watch it happen, and you actually calm down. You do that 10 times and it no longer bothers you. Well, what you've learned that you didn't die, but more importantly than that, you've learned that you could withstand the threat of death. That's what you've learned. And then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and finally you're back in what's no longer the elevator from a symbolic perspective. It's a tomb, right? It's, it's, it's a place of enclosure and isolation. And you learn, hmm, turns out I can withstand that. And then you're met much more together, much more confident. And that's often one of the things that often happens in situations like that. I've seen this multiple times is that if you run someone through an exposure training process like that and, and toughen them up, they'll often start standing up to people around them in a way they never did before because they wouldn't stand up for themselves before because they weren't willing to undermine the protection. See, if you're protecting me, I can't bother you because I can't afford to forsake your protection. So if I'm gonna play that game, I'm gonna be hi hide behind you, then I can't challenge you. So that's no good because that's sometimes why people, you see this with guys very frequently, they're still deathly afraid of their father's judgment when they're in their 30s or 40s. It's like, well, why? Because well, they still want to believe that there's someone out there that knows. And so they're willing to accept the subjugation because it doesn't force them to challenge the idea that there's someone out there that knows. Because that's the advantage of having your father as a judge, right? Because he knows. Well, what if he doesn't? What if no one knows any better than you? Well, that's a rough thing. You don't, until you realize that, you're not an adult, right? That's really technically the point of realization of adulthood is that no one actually knows what you should do more than you do. I mean, it's a horrible realization because what the hell do you know? It's a terrible realization and people will often pick slavery, permanent slavery to the spirit of the great father, let's say, over that realization and it's completely understandable. But 
The problem with it is, is that there's more to you than you think. And so if you continue to hide behind that figure, then you never have a chance to understand that there's more to you than you think, far more to you than you think. Maybe there's enough to you so that you can actually withstand the threat of mortality without collapsing. Maybe even withstand the threat of malevolence without collapsing. Who knows? It's certainly possible. And it's not an abstract question. It's exactly the sort of question that you address in the psychotherapeutic process. It's, it's always the question that you address. And the answer is often in the affirmative because people can get unbelievably tough. And you know that because people work in emergency wards and hospitals, right? Or they work in, in uh, palliative care wards or they work as mortuary assistants. I mean, these people have bloody rough jobs. You know, or they're on the front line of police investigation into, you know, heinous child abuse crimes. And so they're confronting malevolence on a regular basis. And, you know, those are very stressful jobs, but people do them. And, and some people do them without even being damaged by them. Although that's a harder thing because you can see horrible things, you know, things you'll never forget. The problem is, it's true. You're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're oppressed. God only knows why. Maybe you're too short or you're not as beautiful as you could be or, you know, your parent, your grandparent was a serf, likely, because almost everybody's grand great-grandparent was. It's like, you know, and you're not as smart as you could be and you have a sick relative and you have your own physical problems and it's like, frankly, you're a mess and you're oppressed in every possible way, including your ancestry and your biology and the entire sum of human history has conspired to produce victimized you with all your individual pathological problems. It's like, yes, true. Okay, but the problem is, is that it is true. And so if you take the oppressed, you have to fractionate them and fractionate them. And it's like, you're a woman. Yeah, okay, well, I'm a black woman. Well, I'm a black woman who has two children. Well, I'm a black woman who has two children and one of them isn't very healthy. And then, well, I'm a, I'm a Hispanic woman and I have a genius son who doesn't have any money so that he can't go to university. And, you know, I had a hell of a time getting across the border. It was really hard on me to get my citizenship. My husband is an alcoholic brute. It's like, well, yeah, that sucks too. And so, well, so let's, let's, let's fix all your oppressive oppression. And we'll take every single thing into account and then we'll fix yours too. We'll take every single thing into account. It's like, no, you won't because you can't. You can't. It is technically impossible. First of all, you can't even list all the ways that you're oppressed. Second, how are you going to weight them? Third, who's going to decide? And that's the bloody thing. Who's going to decide? That's the thing. Well, what's the answer in the West? It's like in free markets. Oh, yeah, Christ, we'll never be able to solve this problem. No one can solve it. What are we going to do about that? We're going to outsource it to the marketplace. You're going to take your sorry, pathetic being and you're going to try to offer me something that maybe I want. And I'm going to take my sorry, pathetic being and I'm going to say, well, all things considered, as well as I can understand them, maybe I could give you this much money, which is actually a promise, for that thing. And you've packed all of your damn oppression into the price. And I've packed all my oppression into the willingness to pay it. And that solution sucks. It's a bad solution, but compared to every other solution, man, it's why 10% of us have freedom. And so there, there's a tremendous illogic at the bottom of this. It's like you have to fractionate the oppressed all the way down to the level of the individual. Well, that's what the West figured out. You know, there's a couple of figures who at the mythological roots of our culture and you know, people get upset with me because I bring in religious themes, but I understand some things about mythology and religion. And it's not an accident that the axiomatic Western individual is someone who was unfairly nailed to a cross and tortured. It's like, yes, right, exactly. So what do you do about that? Well, I thought about that for a long time too. It's like, well, you don't get together in a damn bob because all that does is allow you to be as horrible as you could possibly imagine and suffer from none of the consequences. That's a bad idea. So how about we don't do that? Well, there's a deep idea in the West too. It's like, pick up your damn suffering and bear it and try to be a good person so you don't make it worse. Well, that's a truth, you know? 
I read a lot about the terrible things that people have done to each other. You just cannot even imagine it. It's so awful. So you don't want to be someone like that. Now, do you have a reason to be? Yes. You have a lots of reasons to be. God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is going to die. You know, you too. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way. And lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, yeah, no wonder you're resentful. It's like, act it out and see what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit. And that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. So you think, well, what do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Well, who wants to admit that? Well, just think about it. Well, so what do you do in the face of that suffering? Try to reduce it. Start with yourself. What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies, you're not whining away in a corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. Of course you're a victim. Jesus, obviously. Put yourself together. And then maybe if you put yourself together, you know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you, if you'll admit it. You know there's a few things you could, like, polish up a little bit that you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit, and then your eyes will be a little more open, and then you can shine yourself up a little bit more, and then maybe you could bring your family together instead of having them be the hateful, spiteful, neurotic, infighting batch that you're, like, doomed to spend Christmas with. So then you fix yourself up a little bit, kind of humbly, because, you know, God, you're a fixer-upper if there ever was one. And then you've got to figure out, well, can you figure out how to make peace with your idiot brother? And probably not, because he's just as dumb as you, so how the hell are you going to manage that? And so then you, maybe you get somewhere that way, and your family's sort of functioning, and you find out, well, that kind of relieved a little bit of suffering, although it reduced the opportunities for spiteful revenge, and that's kind of a pain in the neck. And so... Then you get your family together a little bit, and you're a little clued in then, at least a bit, because you've done something difficult that's actually difficult. You're a little wiser, and so then maybe you could put a tentative finger out beyond the family and try to change some little thing without wrecking it. It's like, our society is complex, and we teach our students that they could just fix it. It's like, go fix a military helicopter and see how far you get with that. It's like, what are you going to do? You're like a chimp with a wrench. Whack! Oh, look, it's better. It's like, no, it's not better. Things are complicated, and to fix things is really hard. And you have to be like a, a golden tool to fix things, and you're not. So, and that's the other message of the West. It's like, how do you overcome the suffering of, the, of life? And I'm not saying it's only the message of the West. How do you overcome the suffering of life? It's be a better person. That's how you do it. Well, that's hard. It takes responsibility. And I think, you know, if you said to someone, you want to have a meaningful life? Everything you do matters. That's the definition of a meaningful life. But everything you do matters. But you're going to have to carry that with you. Or do you want to just forget about the whole meaning thing and then you don't have any responsibility because who the hell cares? And you can wander through life doing whatever you want, gratifying impulsive desires for how useful that's going to be. And you're stuck in meaninglessness, but you don't have any responsibility. Which one do you want? Well, ask yourself, which one are you pursuing? And you'll find very rapidly that it isn't the majority of your soul that's pursuing the whole meaning thing. Because, well, look what you have to do to do that. Yeah have to take on the fact that life is suffering. You have to put yourself together in the face of that. Well, that's hard. Christ, it's amazing people can even do it. I'm stunned every day when I go outside and it isn't a, a riot with everything burning. Because really, God, you talk to people, it's like, I knew this guy, he'd been in a motorcycle accident and it really ruined him. And he was like a linesman, you know, working on the power. And he was working with someone who had Parkinson's disease. And, they had complementary inadequacies. And so 
Two of them could do the job of one person, and so they're out there fixing power lines in the freezing cold, despite the fact that one was three quarters wrecked with a motorcycle accident, the other one has Parkinson's. It's like, that's how our civilization works. It's like, there's all these ruined people out there, they've got problems like you can't believe. Off they go to work and do things they don't even like, and look, the lights are on. My God, it's unbelievable. It's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And we're so ungrateful college students, the postmodern types, they're so ungrateful, you know, they don't know that they're surrounded by just a bloody miracle, it's a miracle that all this stuff works, that all you crazy chimpanzees that don't know each other can sit in the same room for two hours sweltering away without tearing each other apart, because that's what chimps do, so, <sighs> anyways, so, what happened, well I made some videos, and I got to the bottom of some things, at least as far as I can tell, so I told you what the bottom is, and then I got this idea about what you might do about it, which isn't my idea, it's like, it's not my idea, it's an old, 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 old idea, it's far older than Christianity, it's old, it's the oldest story of mankind, get yourself together, transcend your suffering, see if you can be some kind of hero, make the suffering in the world less. Well, that's the way forward, as far as I can tell, if there is any way forward. When I was 25 or so, I probably weighed about 138 pounds. I smoked like a pack of cigarettes a day. I drank a tremendous amount of alcohol. I was from northern Alberta, this rough little town up in northern Alberta called Fairview. And, you know, there were long winters there, and my friends were heavy drinkers. And most of them dropped out of school by the time they were 15 or 16, went off to work on the oil rigs. and. You know, it was a rough town, and we drank a lot. I started when I was 14, and, you know, um, and so I was, I had a lot of bad habits, let's say, and uh, things that were, and I wasn't in great shape physically, and I was also still intellectually obsessed by, as I am now, and uh, so that would have been, that would have been in 85, but when I, but I decided around then, about 85, 84 something like that maybe a little earlier that I was really going to try to get my act together and uh, So I started doing that. I you know, I first of all I, I Quit smoking. Well, that took a long time because I eventually had to quit drinking too in order to quit smoking and I Started working out and playing sports, which I'd never done. I was a small kid I'd been skipped a grade and I was a small small for my age So sports were never especially team sports were never really a domain of expertise for me um, although I skied and went trapping with my dad and went, you know, cross-country skiing and camping and all that. So, but uh, when I went to graduate school, I started swimming. <laughs> the first, the first uh, physical exercise routine I did, I enrolled in a ex swim exercise course, I think it was called. So it was me and this like really overweight kid and like these 60-year-old women and men, they could out-exercise me like mad. It was really embarrassing me and the, the overweight kid, you know, we'd be just panting ourselves three quarters to death at the end of the bloody workout and these 60-year-old women who weren't in great shape were like, you know, chatting away uh, as if nothing was going on at all in the pool. So that was quite embarrassing and as was going to the weight room, you know, because when I started I could barely best bench press 75 pounds and people used to keep coming over and helping me, which was the last thing I bloody well wanted but certainly needed. And I got to the point where I could bench press 225 pounds, I think that was the best I did, and I gained about 30 pounds of muscle in a year and a half, so that was a good thing. So like I was kind of a wild man, and you know, I'm a little bit manic in my in my uh, temperament, and so you know, I was, I was kind of going every direction at the same time. So. And, uh, you know, I don't regret that. I had a fine time when I was a kid, and, but uh, I needed really to get disciplined. And I had to do it because I was working on these hard problems that, you know, that I've been discussing with all of you, and I've been working on them really, you know, obsessively since I was probably about 18, maybe even earlier than that. And got to the point around 25 when I was in graduate school trying to get my PhD, so doing all my research. Like I published 15 papers by the time I graduated with my PhD, which was by, I think, by a fairly large measure, the most papers that any graduate student at that time had ever published at McGill. I think that's right. Might have been twice as many or maybe twice as many, maybe even three times as many. And at the same time, I wrote Maps of Meaning, which was a terrible, terrible, terribly difficult thing to do because I was writing about three hours a day doing that and I couldn't do all that and continue with my misbehavior you know my sort of 
my, what, what would you say, my, my, my hedonistic, my hedonistic, my massive hedonistic consumption of alcohol and all of that. I just couldn't keep it up and also work seriously on the issues that were at hand. So, you know, I had to stop. That's a sacrifice. I had to stop messing about and straighten myself out. And I, I got married while my, the woman who's my wife, Tammy, who, who I've known since she was eight years old, she lived across the street from me in this little town called Fairview. And I was in love with her like the first time I saw her, which is quite the bloody thing. So that's worked out pretty well for me. But she came to live with me about the same time. And, you know, we decided jointly to get our act together. And we swore that we'd tell each other the truth, which I think she's actually done better than me. Like, I don't think, I don't think she's lied to me ever in our entire marriage, which is unbelievable, you know. And it's been so useful because I can really tell her things and we can really talk. So I tell you, if you want to have a good relationship, man, you embed it in the truth. Because if you don't embed it in the truth, you don't have a relationship. It's, it's just lies. It's, it's a tissue of lies. And it will, it will dissolve in the chaos as soon as a crisis comes along. So the truth is a terrible thing, but not, not compared to falsehood. So... Any advice for students here? Yeah, read great books. Mm -hmm. Really, man? You've got this four-year period that, that has been carved out of your lives by society. They, they, it's, it's given you an identity, like a high-quality identity, and freedom at the same time. And you're not going to get that again in your life. You've got, a, you've got a respectable identity, university student, and complete freedom associated with that, or as near as you're ever going to get. And you've got these unbelievable libraries that are full of the writings of people mm -hmm. who, are, who are intelligent and articulate beyond comprehension. And, you know... And, and you can go there and you can learn all this. And you might think, well, why should you learn it? Um, well, you, you learn it to get a job or you learn it to pe get good grades or you learn it to get a degree. And that's all nonsense. It's nonsense. The reason that you come to university to be educated is because there is nothing more powerful than someone who is articulate and who can think and speak. It's power. And I mean power of the best sort. It's authority and influence and respectability and competence. And so you come to university to craft your highest skill. And your highest skill is to be found in articulated speech. And if you're, if, you're, if you're a master at formulating your arguments, you win everything. And better than that, when you win everything, everyone around you wins too. Because to transform yourself into, let's consider, consider your transformation to something approximating the logos. It means you shine a light on the whole world. Well, there's nothing more exciting to do than that. There's nothing better you can possibly do. And to think that you're coming to university to be, you know, trained to have a job, it's like, great, that's a hell of a lot better than being unemployed and covered with Cheeto dust while you're snacking away in front of your video game in the basement. But it's not, it's not a, and I don't have anything against video games, by the way. But, it, it, <laughs> but it's hardly a triumphant call to, to being in the world. And that's what university should be calling for. It's like, God, you people, you, as, you know, I, I know what Harvard students are like. I taught here for five years. You people are spectacular. You're spectacular. You, you're, you're, you're all capable of being world beaters. You transform yourself into something that's articulated and sensible and grounded in history and knowledgeable and wise, man. You can do anything you want and hopefully anything you want for good. Because if you have any sense, everything you want to do would be for the good. Because there's nothing more compelling or meaningful or or useful in combating the tragedy of life than to, than to struggle with all your soul on behalf of the good. And the universities have forgotten that. It's why everyone's bailing out of the humanities, and they should, the humanities are corrupt. And they're corrupt because they're not telling students this. It's so bloody obvious. It's like, learn to think, learn to speak, learn to read. It makes you a superpower, an individual superpower. You have, it, it, and I don't understand why that isn't just told to students. It's not that hard to understand, and everyone wants to hear it. It's like, really, I could do that? I could do that? It's like, yeah, really, you could do that. And the whole society around you has labored for, really, thousands of years to provide every single one of you with this spectacular opportunity that you have while you're undergraduates and graduate students here. Mm -hmm. Man, they're just, everyone's just praying that you would come here and manifest everything that you could manifest. And that's what you should be doing instead of waving placards and complaining about how you're oppressed, for God's sake. You see these Yale students complaining about their oppression. It's just, it just leaves me aghast. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
Well, we're against the ruling class. It's like, no, 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 you're baby ruling class <laughs> members. You're young. <laughs> The only reason you're not rich is because you're young. You know, that's the best, really, that's the, if you look at the 1% even, the, the dreaded 1%, you know, most of those people are old. Why? Well, when you progress through life, if you're reasonably successful, you trade in your promising youth for your wealthy old age, but you're still bloody old. Would you, <laughs> would you trade it? Would you trade your youth for that? Like if you factor age out of the economic equation, things look a lot different. Well, of course older people have more money. If they have any sense, they've been collecting it for their whole life. Is that somehow unfair? It's not unfair unless you want to want to be poverty stricken when you're 70. And you, and you don't want to be poverty stricken, po poverty stricken when you're 70. So I just don't understand what's happened to the universities. I can't believe that you're not told when you come the first day, look, man, you are on, you're here on a heroic mission you're going to take your capacity to articulate yourself to levels that are undreamed of. You're going to come out of here unstoppable. You're going to be able to do anything you want. It's like, that's what you're here for. Instead, you're taught that, well, you know, the world's a pretty oppressive place and you're probably the bottom of the victim pile and, 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 there's, and there's, oh, there's virtually nothing you can do about it except you know, deconstruct the patriarchy. And it's so weak deed and so pathetic that, that, that universities should be embarrassed that that's what they're peddling to students. I'm embarrassed by it. You know, I've, I've gone on public record telling parents, bloody well, send your boys to trade school because at least they'll learn something useful. And that's a terrible thing for someone like me to say because I do believe that, the art, that being articulated and educated in the highest possible manner is there's nothing that's better for you and for society. And why, are the, why have the universities forgotten this? Well, that's postmodern neo-Marxism for you, you know. That, then the philosophy of intense resentment and oppression and group identity and God, it's just mm. pathetic. Dr. Peterson, I think a lot of students here would agree with you that one of the main purposes of uh, education at college, particularly at Harvard, is to develop their sense of articulation, their ability to read, their ability to cri uh, critically think. But then what comes after? Particularly at Harvard, there's a big discussion on what is a good life? What does it mean to use those skills that we get here and then we graduate? What do we do from there? Stop, and I think, stop mm -hmm. unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You know, that, so, that, that's your mm -hmm. calling. It's like you say, well, what do you do after you graduate? Well, if you graduate articulated and powerful, Mm -hmm. There will be people giving you so many opportunities, you won't even be able to keep up with them. You know, and, and, and I've worked with comp very, very competent people in many different domains in my life, hyper-competent people. And I can tell you some very interesting things about hyper-competent people. The first thing is they are not selfish and they're not greedy. And one of the great pleasures in their lives is to find people who have the capacity to also be hyper-competent and to open doors for them as rapidly as they can possibly be opened. They delight in that because there is, there's nothing, there's, there's very few things that are more intrinsically meaningful if you're an accomplished person than to find young people who have the possibility of being accomplished and say, hey, look, here's an opportunity for you. It's like, go out there, man, kill it. And then they go out there and kill it. And you think, right on, man, here's another opportunity. Why don't you go out there and nail that too? And you think, no, no, they're all hoarding their wealth and they're not going to share it with anyone. It's like, that's absolute, complete rubbish. Mm -hmm. And so you don't even have to worry about what you're going to do after you graduate from here if you, if you turn yourself into half of what you could be because people will be dying to offer you every opportunity that you can possibly make use of. So it's, it's, it's a moot point. The, the, the world is always desperately short of people who can think and speak. And, and you think, well, I, that, I won't be made use of. Or you, first of all, you can't say that if you're, in, if, if you're at Harvard, for God's sake. I mean, people already figured out who you are. They've already figured it out. And they're offering you the world on a, on a gold platter. They take it. It's yours. Take it. It's like, great, man. Put yourself together and deserve it. That would be great. And that's what everyone wants. It's what your parents want. It's also what you want. You know it. It's what you want. It's what men, it's what women want from men. It's what men want from women. It's like for you to be who you could be. And, and the highest faculty of the human being is articulated speech. It, it's, it's the divine faculty. And there is nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing that's even in the same league. And so if you, if you don't have faith in that, then, you're, then your priorities are misplaced. And I, I can't even understand why you wouldn't have faith in that 
being, say, Harvard students, because look where it's got you already. You know, you're already sitting on top of the world. So make, deserve it, make use of it, right? Go out there and fix things up. That's what you need to do. There's lots of things that need to be fixed up. And what you want to do is burden yourself with so much responsibility that you can barely stand. And then you'll get stronger trying to lift it up. And you won't be asking, what should I be doing with my life? Or what's the meaning of life or any of that? It'll be self-evident. Mm -hmm. It's self-evident. At minimum, you could say, there's more suffering in the world than there should be. And I could probably do something about that. And you can do something about that. So go do something about it. And then there'll be less suffering in the world. And then when you're 80, you can look back on your life and say, well, you know, there's less suffering in the world than there, than there would have been had I not existed. And, and you don't have to even have a, a sense of, of ultimate destiny or even any sort of theistic belief to regard that as a positive good. Like, I think it goes beyond the, the mere pragmatic utility of addressing the world's ills, because I think we do live in a, in, a, in a world that has a transcendent reality as well as the reality that we can detect. But even independently of that, it doesn't matter. It's like, I mean, this is part of the reason I like people like Bill Gates is a great example, man. That guy, is, he's after five major diseases at the same time, right? He's trying to wipe out polio. He's trying to wipe out um, malaria. Yeah, exactly. He's trying to wipe out malaria. It's like, well, what should you do with your life? Well, you know, take a look at Bill Gates and see if you could do something like that. That would be good. You know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet, because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider, but there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. And then the second part of that is, well, Imagine that many people did that, because we've done a lot as human beings, we've done a lot of remarkable things. And I've told you already, I think before that today, for example, about 250,000 people will be lifted out of abject poverty, and about 300,000 people attached to the electrical power grid. We're making people, we're lifting people out of poverty collectively at a faster rate that's ever occurred in the history of humankind by a huge margin. And that's been going on unbelievably quickly since the year 2000. The UN had pl planned to have poverty between 2000 and 2015, and it was accomplished by 2013. So there's inequality developing in many places, and you hear lots of political agitation about that. But overall, the, the tide is lifting everyone up, and that's a great thing. And We have no idea how fast we could multiply that if people got their act together and really aimed at it. Because, you know, my, my experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourself. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done. That's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's... 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. 
and you are doing that right now and it's because you're young wasting fifty thousand dollars a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because i'm not going to last nearly as long and so if your life isn't everything it could be you could ask yourself well what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you you'd be who knows how much more efficient 10 times more efficient 20 times more efficient that's the Pareto distribution you have no idea how efficient efficient people get it's completely it's off the charts well and if we all got our act together collectively and stop making things worse because that's another thing people do all the time not only do they not do what they should to make things better they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package if people stopped really really trying just to make things worse we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that so there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability social judgment both of which are 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 major causes of suffering and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt and that's the thing that's interesting too is that and like one of the another thing I've often asked my undergraduate classes is you know there's this idea that that people have that people have a conscience and you know what the conscience is it's it's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing you don't have to listen to it strangely enough but you go ahead and do it anyways and then uh, of course exactly what the conscience told you was going to happen inevitably happened so that you feel even stupider about it than you would if it happened by accident because you, you know I knew this was going to happen I got a warning it was going to happen and I went and did it anyways and the funny thing too is that that conscience operates within people and we really don't understand what the hell that is so you might say, well, what would happen if you abided by your conscience for five years or for 10 years? What sort of position might you be in? What sort of family might you have? What sort of relationship might you be able to forge? And you can be bloody sure that a relationship that's forged on the basis of who you actually are is going to be a lot stronger and more welcome than one that's forged on the basis of who you aren't. Now, of course, that means that the person you're with has to deal with the full force of you in all your ability and your catastrophe and that's a very very difficult thing to negotiate but if you do negotiate it well at least you you have something you have somewhere solid to stand and you have somewhere to live you have a real life and it's a great basis upon which to bring children into the world for example because you can have an actual relationship with them instead of torturing them half to death which is what happens in a tremendous a tremendously large minority of cases well, it's more than that, too, because, and this is what I'll close with, and this is why I wanted to introduce Solzhenitsyn's writings to you, you see, because it isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way and then it'll decline rapidly, but seven billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that seven billion, and so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model, because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you, you'll know a thousand people, at least over the course of your life, and they'll know a thousand people each, and that puts you one person away from a million and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward, and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence, it's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really asked yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters. But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. 
It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. Now, when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff, and I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr, so that's a pretty good deal, all things considered. Especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really, really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what hell is like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit, or even more importantly, if it's a, light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends, because that's what happened in the 20th century. If you're hungry, it's not a deterministic drive. It's a subpersonality that has a goal, and then it has a bunch of action patterns that are going to work in reference to that goal. It has a bunch of perceptions that, that suit that goal, and it organizes your emotional responses around that goal. And so to think about it as a personality is a much, it's a much more intelligent way to look at it. One other thing about Skinner's rats, you know, Skinner could get rats to do almost everything, and he would reward them with food. And so he had a simple rat model, but his rats were starved down to 75% of their normal body weight. So not only were they not social, gregarious rats, like rats are, because they were isolated, they were genetically um, altered from wild rats, but they also weren't as complex as a real rat because they were starving. And so, but you know, a starving rat is a pretty good model of a rat, and a rat is a pretty good model of a person. But our, a lot of our models of simple behavioral learning were based on starving, isolated rats. So, anyways, how to think about motivation? We'll think about it from the hypothalamic perspective. So we could say one thing that motivation does is set goals. And we could say that emotions track progress towards goals. And I'm going to use that schema, even though it's not exactly right. So you say, well, motivation determines where you're going to aim. So if you're hungry, you're going to aim at something to eat. And then that will organize your perceptions so that you zero out everything that isn't relevant to that task, which is almost everything. You concentrate on those few things that are going to facilitate your movement forward. When you encounter those things, that produces positive emotion. As you move through the world towards your goal, and you see that things are laying themselves out that facilitate your movement forward, those things cause positive emotion. And if you encounter anything that gets in the way, then that produces negative emotion. And it can be like threat, because you're not supposed to encounter something that gets in the way. It can be anger, so that you move it away. It can be frustration, disappointment, grief. Those would, if, if you had a response that serious to an obstacle, it would probably punish the little motivated frame right out of existence. You know, so you walk downstairs and, I don't know, the contracting company has set a wrecking ball through your kitchen. It's like, that's going to be disappointing. You're not going to keep eating the peanut butter sandwich in the rubble. That little frame is going to get punished out of existence, and some new goal is going to pop up in its stead. And, you know, one of the things we're going to try to sort out is how do you decide when you've encountered an obstacle that's so big that you should just quit and go do something else because that's not obvious you know and you can you can get into counterproductive persistence pretty easily so we, we don't know how people solve that problem it's a really complicated one so anyways we're going to work on that scenario your hypothalamus pops up micro goals that are directly relevant to biological survival that produces a frame of reference so it's not a goal it's not a drive and it's not a collection of behaviors, it's a little personality. And the personality has a viewpoint, it has thoughts that go along with it, it has perceptions, it has action tendencies, all of that. You can see this in addiction, most particularly. So, one of the things that you find often with people who are alcoholic is they lie all the time. And that's because when they're, they built a little alcohol dependent personality inside of themselves or a big one it might maybe it's 90% of their personality and one of that one of the things that consists of 
is all the rationalizations that they've used over the years to justify their addiction to themselves and to other people. And so the addiction has a personality. You know, and so when the person is off, or maybe they're addicted to meth or something like that, where you know the addiction is more, it's, it's, it's more short-term powerful, than I would say, than an alcohol addiction. They'll say anything. And the, 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 the words are just tools used to get towards the goal. And if they happen to be deceptive, whatever, it doesn't matter. They're just practical tools to get towards the goal. And then when you get towards the goal and you take a nice shot of meth or something like that, you reinforce all those rationales that you use to get the drug, and then the next time you're even a better deceiver and liar. So, okay, so we're going to say motivations, one way of thinking about it is they set goals, but it's not the right way of thinking about it. They produce a whole framework of interpretation. And so we're going to think about that framework of interpretation. And then emotions emerge inside of that. So that's it. So the world is framed, motivation set goals. You could say the world has to be framed. So motivation sets that frame. Cruise goals, emotions, perceptions, and actions. And then actions track progress. So positive emotion says you're moving forward properly towards your goal. And if you encounter something you don't expect, you stop. That's anxiety. It's like, oh, we're not where we thought we were. And so we don't know what to do. So we should stop because we don't know where we are, or what we're doing. Stop, frozen. And then the more powerful negative emotions like pain, they might make you get out of there. So emotions, forward, stop, reverse. That's your emotions within that motivated frame. So, and that's another example of how your mind is embedded in your body. Your emotions are like they're, they're offshoots of action tendencies. That's, that's the right way to think about it. Because action is everything, fundamentally. So what are some basic motivations? Uh, most of these are regulated by the hypothalamus, by the way, and that, that tells you just how important a control system it is. The other thing that's useful to know about the hypothalamus is that it has projections going up from it that are like tree trunks, and inhibitory projections coming down that are like grape vines. So you can kind of control your hypothalamus as long as it's not on too much, but if it's on in any serious way, it's like it, it wins. So partly what you do to stop yourself from falling under the dominion of your hypothalamus is to never ever be anywhere where its action is necessary. Right? You don't want to go into a biker bar because you might find yourself in a situation where panicked defensive aggression is immediately necessary. You probably don't want that. You don't want the panic, you don't want the terror, you don't want the frenzied fight, you don't want any of that. You don't want to have to run away in absolute panic. So you just don't go there. And, and a huge a huge part of how we regulate our emotions is just by never going anywhere where we have to experience them. And so that has very little to do with internal inhibitory control and everything to do with staying where you belong. So, okay. So, basic motivations. Hunger, thirst, pain. Pain is not regulated by the hypothalamus. That's a different circuit. Anger slash aggression. Thermal regulation. Panic and escape. Affiliation and care, sexual desire, exploration, play, and you can kind of break those in. You can kind of break those into uh, the classic Darwinian categories too, and say, well, there's a set of motivations that go along with self-maintenance. That'd be your survival, ingestive and defensive. See, I've sort of coded them there. So the the self-maintenance. There's an ingestive set of basic motivations that go with self-maintenance. You say that's hunger, thirst. There's a set of defensive motivations. Pain, anger, thermal regulation, panic and escape. And then there's, there's motivations that are associated with reproduction, affiliation, care, and sexual desire. And then I put exploration in place sort of outside of that. Uh, I would say because those two things serve both of these approximately equally.